So that taper that we got to cut is uh, just to touch over four degrees. Uh, just going off the dimensions that uh, Justin had given me. He measured that with the calipers, but it's uh, four degrees, eight minutes. So I'm going to just indicate the taper in uh, according to the taper per foot that I calculated. I got it wrote down over there. Uh, taper per inch is what I've got it figured out at. But we're going to go ahead and loosen up the taper attachment here and set it to four degrees because that'll put us right there where we need to be. If I had to guess, the taper is probably four degrees. But when you've got like an old part that you're having to measure with, you, you know, dial calipers, you're not going to be exact. So I'm just reading the, the four degree right there in the pointer. I'm just going to leave it right there. It's just, just in front of that line. And all that is a reference that just to get you close. All right, I had to go back and move this over. I, I forgot that I had to <clears throat> double it on this one to go to the eight degree mark instead of the four. So the four, it was four degrees, four degrees per side. So you got to put it over on eight. I wasn't getting anywhere near I needed to be. So now we're getting close. I'm within just a few thousandths, but I'll show you my setup right here. So let's go back and then you got to eliminate the backlash. So what I want to do is start the carriage dial on a zero where I can travel exactly one inches. So I'm going to go up to that very first zero, and we're lined back up on a zero there. Just tweak it. Now I'm going to count exactly one inch. So we want the taper per inch is going to be 145 thousandths. Five. All right, there's one inch right there. So you can see we've, we've gone around one, 140,000. So I've got to do a little tweaking on it, just a little bit to get it to 145,000. All right, let's try it again. All right, we're a little bit closer. Got to do some more adjusting. All right, a couple more fine tweaks. I think we finally got it. All right, there's one inch. It looks like we're just about on 145, so I'm happy with that. Our taper is now set. All right, let's see if we can make some cuts. Using the compound to touch that corner off there, and I'll probably end up having to take the tool out every time so that we clear the thread because you got to eliminate the backlash there. Yeah, it's going to try to hit it there, so going to go ahead and take it out and then move it past it and drop it back in well maybe we can do it like this right here there we go I see what's going on now I was supposed to uh, divide that in half so I was doing the total taper so Instead of it being 145, we actually got to uh, decrease it to uh, 72 and a half. So I was right the first time. I just wasn't doing my math right on paper. So let me uh, reset this uh, properly to uh, 70. It's going to be 72 and a half thousandths uh, per inch per side of taper because I noticed that that was pretty steep and we're getting real close to our small diameter there and we're halfway across there. All right, so I'll bring you back once I reset that taper attachment. All right, reset. All right, there's 72 and a half on the dial, so now we should be right. All right, let's get back to it. We should have our taper ready to go now.
Just using a compound to just kind of manually feed it in a little. We are almost there. is yeah we're not we're not far off right there about five thousandths so we speed it up slow the feed rate down see if we can get a little better finish out of it Looks like it's completing the uh, the top diameter there. Yep. So that says 677 where I just snapped a measurement and uh, 675 on the print, but I think we're good to go there now. Break that edge. I do want to polish up that taper though. Alright, we're going to set up to get the hex milled on this on this pin, and I think we'll give the uh, K&T mill here a little light duty workout instead of going over to the little do-all. So I'm going to use <clears throat> a uh, 5C collet block right here. This is the hex collet, and we've got a 3 quarter inch collet installed, and we will hold that on the threads there, just like so, and uh, tighten it up, and then we'll be able to use this to... Uh, mill our hex so we'll set it in there like that and then once we get our depth set once we get our depth set there we'll be able to take it out and just flip it you know five more times and that that will uh, cut our hex nice and easy <coughs> I've, I've been having a sinus issue this week so that's why I've been kind of <coughs> sounding a little bit rough here so I'm going to use my collet setup. We're going to we're going to use this one inch carbide end mill. This is one that I got from the auction that appears to be never been used before. Still razor sharp. So we're going to use that for fun. Use a little bit of carbide. So first thing I want to do is go ahead and get this thing tightened up. And I'm not going to I'm not going to tighten it up on the uh, the shank area. I'm just going to go ahead and snug it by hand just to kind of seat it. And we'll put it in the the vise, and I just got a uh, spanner wrench here that I use. Just like that, and we'll, uh, we'll set it on the other side to do our machining. So our turn diameter there was right around a 1 inch 152. So all we've got to do is just take that and divide it by 2. Let me uh, get into my calculator there. So it's actually, you know, it's going to be 0 .152. 152 divided by 2 is 76. So that's what we're taking off each side. We'll touch off, take 76, and that should put us on a 1-inch hex all the way around it. That was a touch off there. Get our depth set. Just using the power feed there.
I'm going to flip it over and do the the opposite side, flip it 180, that way I can measure it and make sure that my depth's my depth is okay. Nine ninety five, nine ninety three. All right, I think we're going to be good there. That'll give you just a few thousandths clearance for a wrench there. Okay, we'll go ahead and uh, put it back in there and get the rest of them cut. All right, now back to the lathe so we can cut our chamfers on it. Actually, I'm gonna use this in the chuck as well because I wanna be able to pull this out. I don't wanna chuck here. I wanna catch it so that we can go on each side of that with our tool and I need a little bit of clearance. So I'll just put this back into the collet and tighten it up and just uh, chuck this into the six jaw. I'm going to use that top notch threading insert that's got the proper angle. I just want to eyeball it until it gets, it cuts all the way to the bottom of the flat there. Just about. Alright, that's good. Now we'll go to the other side. Alright, that's good. Just need to do a little bit of handy burn on it where it tries to roll the edge over. But that is done. All right, there we go. All finished up. Ready to go. So we're going to send this out there to Justin. Uh, uh, I'll get in the mail tomorrow. And we'll get this out there and he can finish out his uh, custom suspension parts that he's working on. He's doing a custom build. He's got a four-link setup that he's doing. And what he was telling me, the reason why he needed one made is that because of what he's doing, 
this is not an off-the-shelf item that you can buy. So that's as far as I got. I don't really know uh, what the difference is of what you can buy versus this right here. I'm assuming it's like the links there and the thread. So anyway, that's going to be a good part for Justin, and uh, I was happy to help him out and provide a little bit of content there for the channel. So I'll have some links in the uh, video description down below if you'd like to check out Justin's channel and see some of the videos that he's uh, working on, some of the projects that this is going to be going to. All right, so we'll see you guys next time. I've got a couple of new tool scores for the shop here I wanted to share with you. We've got this new tool chest right here, and we've got another item right here. So a friend of mine in town, Van, he's got his own machine shop as well. Been around a long time. I've known him for years. Uh, a friend of mine and I, I visited with him last summer and when I was down there I saw several things in his shop that that I was kind of interested in and you know I would see something and I would say hey what do you, are you would you sell this and uh, most of it no because he's he's collected a lot of that stuff over his lifetime and I think a lot of that stuff he still he wants to hold on in case he needs it for his work but one of those items was this tool chest right here which is a Gerstner toolbox saw it in, in he's got a room there that's got a couple grinding machines that he doesn't even use them it's just sort of a looks more of like a storage room to me and i asked him about that box and he said let me think about it so he called me last week to uh tell me about something unrelated and while i was on the phone with him i asked him about the tool chest again and he said yeah i'll sell it to you so we we came to an agreement and i went down there this morning and bought it from him so pretty cool while I was down there in that same room, I saw this box sitting on another machine. I saw Starrett on the top of it and looked in it, and it's a number 675 indicator stand. So I asked him, would he, would he be willing to sell that? He said, yeah, I'll sell that one to you too. So we made a deal for both of them, and I was happy about it. But it's a really interesting tool chest. These Gerstners are beautiful handcrafted boxes. Uh, Gerstner and Sons is still in business up in Ohio building these things and they're very high quality tool chests. So whenever you find a good used one, they're, uh, they're just kind of a cherished item to uh, get a hold of. Um, I've got one in the shop and then this will make two right here. Uh, honestly, Abby wants one to use so I've been looking for one for her as well. So it's got some paperwork in it which I found really interesting. So we're gonna take a look at that and there's also some writing in the bottom that I want to share with you. I haven't cleaned it off or nothing. I just brought it in here and wanted to share it with you. And let's go through and look at this box and see what's written in there and see what that paperwork is. All right, so here's a little closer look at the box. You see it's very dusty. It needs a good cleaning, which is something I plan on doing with this box. I'd like to do some kind of light light cleaning on it. I wouldn't even call it a restoration. I just really want to kind of give it a buff and see if we can get this uh, wood looking really nice again there. So you'll know it's a Gerstner by the tag here that they put on the bottom drawer, but there's also, they stamp it on the inside Gerstner Sons, which I'll show you as well. All right, so let's open up the, the top here. All right, and in the top, was a bunch of paperwork right here that was in this tool chest whenever Van bought it. And I was excited at first thinking that maybe this was some original paperwork from when it was purchased, but actually what I, what I have come to found out that this is some paperwork that was acquired by probably a second owner of this box, uh, a lady by the name of Miss Catherine Barnes from Pensacola, Florida. And this is dated October 29th, 1992. And she must have acquired some information about this tool chest. And Gerstner and Sons sent her a bunch of information on their tool chest right here. So this is the one that this box right here, it is a model number 052, which they have circled. So list price $530 back in 1992. There you can see the date, promotional, promotional pricing anyway. So drop one, invest in your future, invest in Gerstner. Pretty cool, it's kind of, kind of like a flyer of it. That's just absolutely gorgeous.
replacement part list for the tool chest and an order form. There's some more info on some of their tool chests. But this, this letter is pretty cool. Uh, it says, Dear Miss Barnes, thank you for your inquiry. We are proud of the products we build and pleased that we have earned your interest. Gerstner Sons was founded over 80 years ago as a manufacturer of wood tool chests built for the, the careful storage of precision measuring instruments. Today, in addition to Gerstner tool chests, we now offer a wide variety of wood chests and cases built, especially for those individuals who appreciate fine quality and enclosed uh, information like what I just showed you right there. Jane Ellis, sales manager. So I thought that was really cool that the papers are still in there. So the box is in average condition. You know, it's been well used as a uh, machinist box. That's how Van had it. You know, he, he had it full of tools and uh, he cleaned it out. But what I want to show you is uh, how to really identify that this is a true Gerstner. So the bottom, this is the cover that covers up all the drawers. You know, you, you pull this out and you swing this up and, and it covers it up, locks it up too. All right, but if you pull that out and then go ahead and remove the bottom drawer, just look at the bottom drawer. And we'll go ahead and remove the next one too, just a little bit easier to see. And if you'll notice inside there, I think you can see that. It says built by H. Gerstner and Sons. And it says there's a number of 420 handwritten right there. This also says 654 right there as well. I'm not sure the significance of those numbers. I know that others do know uh, what those mean. So if you look right over here in this area, there's a handwritten note right there and a date. And I want to say that's probably going to be from the original owner of this box, which I think is really cool. So it says R.E. Clapper, 421 North Citrus Street, Pensacola, Florida. And then there's a GL 66931. I'm not sure what the GL means. March 18th, 1965. Very cool to find that in there. And right over here next to it, there's some more handwritten numbers in there. And I, I don't know, I don't know what those signify. They don't make any sense to me, but they look like possibly phone numbers from back in uh, that decade. I, I think that's what they could be. One of them says 71452, and then there's some other numbers there written underneath it. But totally cool to find that inside that box there. So I just wanted to share this with you. I was uh, pretty excited that I was able to uh, buy it from Van and uh, have it around here. So as I said, I, I really want to try to give this thing a nice cleanup. So I think I'm going to do that one day. When I get some extra time, I'm going to try to start working on this and uh, cleaning the wood up and uh, seeing about giving it a good polish. And, and whenever I do, I'll show you what it looks like afterwards, okay? So in addition to the chest, this is the other item that I had bought from Van. You see they got the Starrett logo up on top. So what this is, is a number 675 indicator stand made by Starrett. So this is the base. It's a heavy cast iron base. And then you have the uh, you have the stems inside here as well that go onto the unit that hold it. So the one thing that I did notice is that it is missing one piece, and that's on the end of this rod right here. There should be another attachment on this that holds it that holds the actual indicators with a fine adjustment, and it's missing. But it almost looks to me. I don't believe this is original. I don't know if this is Starrett, and I say that because the ends, they look like they've been ground on. It's possible that it was. I really don't know. But that's what, uh, there's a T-nut right there, and you slide it, slide it up in here, and you mount your indicators on it. So I've got, I've got a couple of these already like this. I've got, the, see, this is the 675 and I have a 665 which was my dad's and that's what we used to use to indicate on the lathe back before we started buying the adjustable arm indicator holders from from Noga
So there's what it looks like together, but it's it's been sitting for a very long time and it's got rust in there, so this needs to be fully cleaned and polished up. But I wanted to show you guys in the in the catalog, so we're looking at catalog number 28. There's the number 675 right there, okay? So they also made it in some other variations. They got it with a granite plate on the bottom and also a big cast iron plate there as well. So there it is, number 675. I don't think that they uh, build this one anymore, but they do build it still with the granite plate on the bottom. I'll show you in the newer catalog. But this arm, this arm right here is the one that I believe is missing from the original uh, from Starrett. So that's, that's going to be an item that I'm, I'm going to be hunting for for this guy right here. This is the newer catalog showing the 675, but in the newest versions of it, you know, the, so it's got the granite plate and the cast iron plate. So I say, I don't think they build it anymore with the, with this base there as well, but they do list the horizontal arm that I'm missing off mine in the uh, individual components. So if I can't find a used one, I'm going to see about get, getting one from Sterrett. So. Just another fine tool. I, I really love collecting these things and cleaning them up. And, uh, you know, I appreciate the quality that goes into these. I just really like them. So that's why I picked it up. I got it for a really good price from Van. He didn't charge me a lot of money for it. And I'm just going to enjoy having this. After making the 30 degree angular cuts on the uh, clamp bars for the fixture, I'm setting my tool head on the shaper back to 90 degrees, make it perfectly square to the to the travel so I thought I would show you this is one particular way that you can do this I'm using a cylinder square uh, sitting flat on the bed of the vise right there this is just a real simple easy way to do it that is going to get this extremely close and square the graduated dials that's engraved on on this tool head is it is very very close that zero mark and that 90 degree line are just about perfect in line with each other but I've, I've been doing my tramming and getting it close and it's, I can tell that it's slightly, there's, there's slightly offline just a little bit, but just like it says in the books, for most work that you're doing on a shaper, using this angular graduated dial in there is usually close enough for most work in the shop. If you need more accurate work, then you need to indicate it in using a sign bar uh, to get a perfect angle, but you're, you're typically not doing that type of precise work on a shaper but if you put that on 30 degrees you're going to be damn near 30 degrees uh, where you're cutting so i'll show you we're going to move the tool head down along the cylinder square and you can see that i've got it very close for probably about uh, i don't know three or four inches of travel that we're going to be moving it all right we got it zeroed up on there i'm in the center of the center of the cylinder square and i'll move it just so you can see all right and then Go back to zero right there, and we'll go ahead and move it down. Just uh, using the hand wheel at the top, the handle, and rotating it down. And it starts to get a little bit snug as we get down there. And we're off to zero on the negative side, a few tenths, but not much at all. And that's uh, probably about three and a half inches of travel right there. I'll go ahead and bring it back up to the top. We're on our zero. You can see it's just floating right there on that on that zero mark. So I've got it where I I feel good about it. It's good and square now. Just one more shot so you can see what I'm doing here. Got everything centered up on the on the square, and I will move it just so that you can see we are engaged on our plunger. I'm going to crank the tool head down. So we're traveling down the cylinder square there. And it's just off that zero mark. Just a touch, a few tenths really depends on just the movement of the screw itself it seems to be moving it around just a bit 
I think that's the um, the play in the gib that you're seeing right there. So we're on zero again. I'm gonna go ahead and bring it back up. Zero. Looking good. So I'm gonna call that nice and square and we're gonna leave it right where it's at. 